Karl was a proud and independent man. In that respect, he was much like those of his generation, born during the First World War and then serving his country during the Second World War. In Karl's case, as RAF ground crew. After the war, Karl worked as a corn and seed merchant. And along with his wife, Marjorie, they raised their four daughters. They had a good life. They were active members of their local church and community. They enjoyed their house and garden, their daughters, and then their grandchildren, and eventually their great-grandchildren. When Marjorie developed dementia, Carl was proud to look after her at home, which he did until her final illness, when eventually she fell and broke her hip and died in hospital. As Carl aged, he became increasingly frail. He began to fall himself. He struggled to manage the house and garden, and yet he remained proudly living at home until the day after his 96th birthday, when following some more falls, his daughters took him to the GP. The GP found that he had a very slow pulse and arranged for him to be admitted to the local hospital where the cardiologists, the heart doctors, fitted a pacemaker. Now the pacemaker sorted out the slow heartbeat but Carl did not get back to his normal self. And he spent the next four weeks on the cardiology ward, failing to improve, until, after some prompting by relatives, further investigations were arranged. One of these was a scan of his head, which revealed a traumatic brain hemorrhage, presumably sustained from a fall before his hospital admission. Now, how can that be? How could Carl have spent four weeks lying in a hospital bed while highly trained doctors failed to make such a crucial diagnosis? I believe because of specialization. Now, in medicine, we have spent many years developing our specialisms, and rightly so. The more you specialise, the better you get at whatever you've chosen to specialise in. And as a patient, that's exactly what you want. You want the best person available for you to give you the best possible outcome. If you have a hernia that needs repairing, then you want to see the surgeon who does hernia after hernia after hernia. If you have heart block like Carl, then you want to see the cardiologists who know a lot about hearts. It's, it's simple. The more you do, the better you get. The better you get, the better the outcome for the patient. And it works for many things. Surgical procedures, heart attacks, strokes, rheumatoid arthritis. It works really well when you know what's wrong with you and when you only have one thing wrong with you. It works really well when you know what's wrong with you and when you only have one thing wrong with you. As soon as there is diagnostic uncertainty, or if you have a plethora of other medical problems, well, all bets are off. Let's say you're breathless. Well, that could be your lungs. So perhaps you should see the respiratory specialist. But then again, heart failure can make you breathless. So perhaps you should see the cardiologist. But thinking about it, anemia can make you breathless, and depending upon the cause of the anemia, perhaps you need to see a haematologist, or maybe a gastroenterologist, or maybe even a bowel surgeon. What I would suggest you need to see is a generalist. Generalists are great. Generalists know a lot about 
a lot. They can take a helicopter view, can take in the big picture and then make a call. They can diagnose and treat many things, avoiding the need for a specialist. And they can signpost you on to the right person to help you with your problem. Generalists are specialists in themselves. They have just specialised in generalism. <laughs> you need these generalists. We all do. And for some, GPs have been called the jewel in the crown of the NHS. And rightly so. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. Who do you think society sees as being more important? Specialists or generalists? Who is thought to have the greater value? In the early years of my training, even when still at medical school, I would be frequently asked, Jonathan, are you going to specialise or just be a GP? <laughs> Notice that little word, just? It implies a hierarchy. It implies that specialists are more important, are cleverer, are better than generalists. It reminds me of that well-known UK TV series. You may have seen it. Doc Martin. Do you recall how the main character came to be a GP? He was a surgeon who developed a fear of the sight of blood. So he just switched to being a GP. No additional training required. The premise behind the whole series is that if you are a specialist, then you know everything that a generalist already knows, and then a whole lot more besides. It implies that in medical training, we are all trained to be GPs, and only a certain few go on to specialise further. This is simply untrue. You have to choose to be a GP. You have to choose the extra generalist training. You have to be accepted upon and complete the training, which not everybody does. And yet still, this sense of specialists being more important than generalist prevails. Now I hope that you are beginning to agree with me that this is a nonsense. Yet the meme is written deep within our culture. It is pervasive and affects all aspects of society way beyond medicine. It drives the education of our children, the training of our young people, and the careers of our workforce. And it is not always helpful. I remember a conversation I had with a friend about my own career aspirations. And I said I quite fancied being a healthcare commentator writing opinion pieces, speaking at events. <laughs> it was suggested to me that in order to do so, that I would need to develop an area of specialism, that I would need to be the expert at something. Now, there are about 32,000 GPs in England, and I chair one of only 211 clinical commissioning groups, each of which will have one GP as chair or accountable officer. That puts me into a cohort of 0.65% of the GPs in England. And yet this was still not seen to be enough. I was required to specialise further. Otherwise, I have nothing important to say. I am just not expert enough. I can think of many other people we encounter in day-to-day -day life outside of medicine who are generalists. Primary school teachers, social workers, solicitors, communications, sales, IT help desk technicians, parish priests. When I crowdsourced, for example, on Facebook and Twitter, people talked passionately about the ability of generalists to cover all bases to work practically to achieve results, to see the bigger picture, and to interact with wide-ranging networks. I believe that generalists can use these connections to think outside the box, to be creative, to connect seemingly unrelated topics, 
and bring them together into coherent strategies that others can understand. I've heard it said, for example, that Charles Darwin would never have come upon his theory of evolution if he had chosen to concentrate only on his chosen specialty of geology. It took a generalist to understand what he was observing, to take a high-level view and bring it all together. Society may seem to value specialists over generalists, but I would call upon all of us to buck this trend. Society may view the phrase jack of all trades as having very negative connotations, but I would call upon us to celebrate and embrace it. Society may view generalists just as those who cannot cut it as a specialist, but I would call upon us to consider the value of choosing to be a generalist, of choosing to be that jack of all trades. If you are still in education and training, you are likely being funneled into a channel of increasing specialization. My 13-year-old daughter will this year be asked to choose her options and will drop some subjects. Only 13 years of age and already being asked to limit the boundaries of her learning. She will be told that it is right and proper that she should be an expert at something, that she should narrow the focus of her interests more and more and more. Now, we do need specialists. So for many people, that is entirely appropriate. But for a good number, you will end up in generalist careers. I would ask you to think about proactively choosing that as an option. And here are some thoughts as to why. In June of this year, Nicole Torres wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review based on research by Jennifer Maluzzi. The research looked at MBA graduates who are entering into careers in investment banking. The research showed that those graduates who had long specialised in investment banking received fewer job offers, job offers and lower salaries than those from more generalist backgrounds. Torres makes a clear link between generalists and leaders. She says that leaders tend to be generalists. They can switch course and manage multiple areas. They're more flexible. And I've been thinking, why is a military general called a general? Commissioned officers are trained to be management and leadership generalists. Our armed forces are run by generalists. Can it be a coincidence that they use the word general for one of their top ranks? And there are other examples. Director general, secretary general, attorney general, general manager, perhaps I should add general practitioner. Despite this, if you have had a career as a generalist, you have likely had times when you have felt second best. When you have felt that if only you had tried harder or chosen a different path that you could perhaps have achieved more. Well, I would want to encourage you. I would want to celebrate you as somebody with a wide area of knowledge that can help. Who can see people holistically who can network and can find innovative solutions not constrained by focused specialties. Let's think about Carl again. Carl needed the cardiologist to sort out his heart. But after that, for four weeks, what value did they add? Carl needed a generalist. He needed somebody who could take stock Somebody who could think outside the box, could see him holistically, could see him as Carl and not as the old man with heart block in bed three and then work out what was going on. Now you may be wondering, are Carl and Marjorie real people? 
or just a convenient fabrication I use to make my point? Well, I can assure you that they are real people. Marjorie died in 2003, and Carl died in 2011 after surgery for the brain hemorrhage. I knew them both, and they were generous, life-affirming people who would have wanted to have celebrated my choice of career as a generalist, just as with me, I would celebrate with all of you who have chosen that career as a jack of all trades. When we tell stories, we change names to protect confidentiality. I didn't know them as Carl and Marjorie. To me, they were simply grandma and grandpa. Thank you. <laughs>